Hello, I am so delighted that you're here, and I hope that you're having a fantastic conference. So for the next 30 minutes or so, my mentor, Dr. Steven Spear, and I will be talking about architecture. I think this will be a broader interpretation of architecture than you might have heard of before, and we'll be talking about why structure and architecture so massively impact the dynamics and performance of a system. I'm hoping that this will potentially elevate and further illuminate the impact of structure and architecture in your own work. And as you've likely heard, Steve and I, we've been working on this book for nearly two years, and we're hoping uh, that it will come out next year. Hoping. Wait, it will come out <laughs> next year. And so we do talks like this to further clarify our own thinking. So let me first introduce Steve. So without a doubt, one of the most impactful learning moments for me was taking a workshop at MIT in 2014, uh, taught by Steven Spear, which is why I went to the class. Um, and I cannot tell you how much uh, he's influenced my own thinking. So he is famous for many things, but he is probably most famous for writing one of the most downloaded Harvard Business Review papers of all time in 1999 called Decoding the DNA of the Toyota Production System. So this was based in part on his doctoral dissertation that he did at the Harvard Business School. And in support of that, he worked on the manufacturing plant for, floor of a tier one Toyota supplier for six months. And so since then, he's extended his work beyond just high repetition manufacturing work to engine design at Pratt & Whitney, to the building of the safety culture at Alcoa, and how we can make truly safe healthcare systems for everyone. And so for the last decade, he's been part of a U.S. Navy initiative to create high-velocity learning across all aspects of that enterprise. And so for the last two years, we've been talking two to three times a week or more, trying to see if we can codify what we've both observed in our careers about that amazing and magical dynamic that is created that can fully unleash human creativity and problem solving in almost every domain. So uh, earlier this year, we presented on aspects of fast and slow integrated problem solving, the four struct characteristics of great structures. And so this time we'll be presenting on more aspects of great architectures and structures. So Steve, I'm so delighted that you're here to teach us about architecture. Yeah, um, Gene, thanks very much. And uh, as far as the book coming out, remember that's early next year, not just any time next year. But <laughs> on the topic of architecture, let, let me just start with uh, a reference. Back in January, I attended a conference, a symposium with, with my wife, Miriam, who's actually an architect. And someone opened up with a quote from Winston Churchill, who said, first we design our buildings and then our buildings design us. And, and what he meant by that is that in the moment of um, doing the drawing, doing the building, doing the construction, we think we have control over the building. And by extension, this was a, a symposium about urban design. We think we have control over the layout of the streets and the placement of the buildings along those streets. But then once all that stuff is in place, they determine how we behave. So we behave on them. And then once we're done behaving, they behave on us. And I, I thought that that was such so telling because you and I have spent so much time talking about the architecture of technical products and the way in which we architect them then determines back how we behave around them and towards them and with each other towards them. And in fact, how we architect our organizations in terms of the flows of information, the possibilities and the pathways for collaboration, we design that social circuitry, but once it's designed, then it designs us back in terms of how we act and how we behave. So anyway, this, this metaphor of architecture is actually, I think, more literal than metaphorical, and I hope to elaborate on it a little bit right now. So again, in terms of background, you, you made reference to some of the work I've done, but really, I've had now 25, 30 years of trying to explain anomalous outcomes. And those anomalous outcomes take the form of 2, 200, and 2,000x. And what I mean by that is that um, back in the 70s and certainly by the 1980s, people were making observations that when you looked, let's say, in the automobile industry, there was Toyota, which had productivity, which was double uh, what was the world standard. And it had levels of quality, which are somewhere between in the hundreds versus the thousands better than anybody else. And um, a few years after the first work came out about Toyota and its uh, manufacturing systems, uh, there were a bunch of people at University of Michigan who did studies of its design systems and found out same ratios that on any given day, Toyota was producing um, twice the number of new models and half the time with much higher manufacturable quality, much higher uh, product quality down the road. 
And as people started looking across um, these different environments, what you started to see is no matter where you looked in industry, you were seeing these ratios of uh, double productivity, hundreds of thousands of times better in terms of quality and in terms of workplace safety, also huge, huge differences, which we documented about Alcoa. I wrote a, a case about that in my book, The High Velocity Edge. But anyway, what we kept finding is no matter where we looked, you mentioned healthcare, social services, you could literally double the output of an organization, increase dramatically its quality. With that doubling of output, you were du- you're reducing costs, increasing affordability, increase- increasing accessibility, so on and so forth. And it turned out no matter where you looked, what you were finding is uh, planes, trains, automobiles, tech, biotech, pharma, healthcare, education, social services, military, and it- every vertical, every sector, and across every phase, every phase of value creation from way upstream discovery all the way through development, design, production, delivery, after sales, uh, service, and that sort of thing, that you were finding these crazy ratios of uh, 2, 200, and 2,000 X. It was every place about everything. And it sort of begs the question, um, where does that come from? And something we've, which we've explored uh, previously, but it's always worth repeating. It's always worth repeating, is that most everyone, when they start a venture, starts at a very, very low level of competency and capability. And and as far as Toyota, because that was the first intersection, automobiles and manufacturing, to put this in some perspective, Toyota in 1958, when they started their venture and their adventure in terms of coming into the U.S. market, they were arguably 